Hi. So we're now starting chapter eight, entitled Many Electron Atoms. This is the first in the series of, I think, three lectures that we're going to tackle on this chapter. What we're doing in this chapter is we're moving away from hydrogen and into atoms with more than one electron. Now, remember that in the chapter seven lectures, we mentioned that hydrogen is the only element that you can actually exactly solve. Um, the Schrodinger equation can be solved exactly for one proton and one electron, or the nucleus and the electron. <clears throat> if you totally um, get rid of all the electrons except one for elements like lithium or helium, you can also use the Schrodinger equation to solve those, but you can only do it for one electron. The reason for that is because if you add on more than one electron, you're complicating your potential energy function. Remember, you solve the Schrodinger equation for a particular potential energy function. It's very difficult in physics to solve so-called three-body or two-body problems or three-body problems or own up from that. If you just have the interaction between the proton and the electron, the potential energy function is pretty simple. But when you start adding in other electrons, then you have to consider in the potential energy function the, repuls the repulsive force between those electrons, and that makes things complicated. It's especially complicated by the fact that in the Schrodinger equation solution, you can kind of consider consider the proton or the nucleus to be stationary and then the electron orbiting around that. But if you add on more than one electron, the distance between the two electrons and where they are and their repulsive force can be really, really super complicated. So these things have to be solved and crunched through numerically. It can be done, but it can't be done exactly and you have to use a lot of approximations. The good news is that <clears throat> what we saw for with the Schrodinger equation already, um, giving us the orbitals and the shapes of the orbitals and what the, they look like for the simple hydrogen atom solution, actually does a pretty good job of describing what's going on with multi-electron atoms. And so we have a strong theoretical basis and understanding as we move forward. So let's talk about what the Schrodinger equation does and does not do. For the hydrogen atom, the Schrodinger equation effectively describes the shapes of the shells and the subshells and explains the hydrogen atom very well. But when you start adding electrons in, it really doesn't have much to say. So it doesn't describe how those shells are filled and in what order, all right? Now, you might assume in sort of a naive kind of way if you had never had any chemistry courses or knew anything about the periodic table, you might assume that if there was a lowest energy state available, like the 1s um, shell, for example, 1s subshell, you might assume that all the electrons would want to be in that 1s subshell because that's the lowest possible energy state. And so you might assume that you would just cram as many electrons as you possibly can into that 1s subshell. And that if there's no restriction, you could put 10 or 12 or 20 or however many electrons that you have have into that lowest energy state and there would be no restriction on that. But it turns out that doesn't match the data. That's not what's actually happening. And it doesn't effectively describe the spectra, for example, of the um, excited state of these multi-electron atoms. It just doesn't work, okay? So they needed a new theory to explain what was going on and why the structure of the atoms was the way that it was. So this enters Wolfgang Pauli, who's famous for his Pauli exclusion principle that really helps explain the periodic table as we know it. Pauli lived from 1900 to 1958. He was actually born in Vienna. Um, he moved to the United States in 1940 to get away from the Nazis in World War II, but he moved back um, to Europe. He moved to Switzerland in 1946. He is the creator, discoverer, if you will, of the Pauli exclusion principle, which we'll cover today. For that work, he won the Nobel Prize in 1945. He did a lot of other really super important work in quantum physics at the time. He was a very well-respected scientist in his day. Um, he's a perfectionist. He could be a little harsh. He was really famous for saying um, that ideas that he didn't think were really good were utterly wrong. And then um, if it was even worse than utterly wrong, then he called it so bad that they weren't even wrong. Okay, so he, he could be a little harsh. Um, but uh, he had a lot of respect for certain scientists and they got along very well, so it's not like he was a total jerk or anything. He was just really focused, let's call him that.
He died in 1958 of cancer, um, relatively young, um, but by that time he had already made so many contributions to physics um, that we still honor and remember him today. So let's talk about the exclusion principle, um, what he won the Nobel Prize for. This helps explain the structure of the periodic table. We've discussed basically four quantum numbers, or five if you count S, but it's always the same, so it's kind of boring. So we're only going to talk about M sub S in terms of spin up or spin down. So the four quantum numbers we've discussed so far, N, the principal quantum number, also known as the energy level, L, the orbital quantum number, which gives us the total angular momentum of the system, M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, which gives us the Z component of that angular momentum, and then M sub S, um, which is uh, tells us what the spin of the electron is, whether it's spin up or spin down. Now, if you take all four of these quantum no numbers together, the exclusion principle says that no two electrons can ever be in the same quantum state if they're affected by the same potential energy. Of course, you can have electrons and whole different atoms that are in the same quantum state within their own atom, okay? There's nothing forbidding that. But you can't have two electrons in the same atom obeying the same potential that have the same set of quantum numbers. That's not okay and won't work. Now what would happen is, if the exclusion principle weren't valid, then all the electrons would just radiate all their energy away until they were in the 1s state and they could all occupy the same state and there would be no restriction on that. But that's not the way electrons work. We know now actually that all spin one-half particles, all fermions, obey the exclusion principle, okay? So they all obey them. Bosons, however, integer spin particles do not obey the exclusion principle. And this leads to some pretty interesting statistics that we'll cover in a later chapter. And it's the difference between Fermi-Dirac statistics, which describe fermions, and Bose-Einstein statistics, which describe bosons. But more about that later. Okay, so with the exclusion principle, we're armed now and ready to describe the periodic table. Okay? So, what you do when you have more than one electron, if you've got a complex atom, is you can look at it as a succession of filled levels which increase in energy. So since the um, electrons can't occupy the same quantum state, but they'd still like to minimize their energy as much as possible, the electrons will fill the lowest energy states first and then work up from that. Once that subshell is filled with the maximum possible uh, allowed number of states, um, then it'll go to the next one and so on and so forth. Okay. Now you can put um, an electron or an atom in an excited state. In that case, the electron will temporarily jump up to a higher energy level, but it won't want to be there. So if there's unoccupied um, lower energy states below it, it'll fall in, emit a photon, and be happy in that lower energy state, and that's the way that it goes. Okay, we're going to define an orbital as an atomic state that's characterized by the quantum numbers N, L, and M sub L, okay? And from the exclusion principle, you can see that each value of M sub L can have at most two electrons, one spin up and one spin down in that state. So each orbital is limited to two electrons, and the number of electrons that can occupy the various shells is also limited by the rules that we talked about earlier. Remember that once you've set your value of N, that restricts your possible values of L. L can only go up to N minus 1, starting at 0 and going up to N minus 1. Once you pick your, N, your L value, your M sub L values are dictated. Your M sub L values run from minus L to plus L in integer steps. And then once you pick your M sub L value, you've got a spin up and a spin down electron that can fit in each one of those. So let me show you what I mean by that. Here's the allowed quantum states going up to N equal to 3. Okay, so if n is equal to 1, the only possible value of L is 0. If L is 0, the only possible value of M sub L is 0. And then you can put at most two electrons in there, one spin up and one spin down. Okay, same thing goes for 2, 0, 0, so I'm not going to belabor that point. But if you have a 2, um, n equal to 2, you can also have L equal to 1. It can go up to that value. If you have L equal to 1, M sub L can be 1, 0, or minus 1. And for each of those M sub L values, you can have a spin up and a spin down electron in each one of those states. Okay? So for 2, you can have L equal to 1, 0, or minus, uh, minus 1. There should be a minus 1 there somewhere. The typo, sorry. And then for um, N equal to 3, your L value can go up to 2. 
okay? Um, and then you have m sub l going from 2 all the way to minus 2 in integer steps. And then each one of those m sub l values has a spin up and a spin down. So hopefully you get the point there. Now in general, each shell for each value of n, you can have up to 2 n squared electrons that fill that level. So for n equal to 1, 2 n squared is 2 and you're done, right? But for n equal to 2, 2 n squared is 2 times 4, which is 8, okay? So on and so forth. Now, there's an additional rule that helps you figure out where to put electrons, and that rule is Hund's rule. So Hund's rule states that if you have an atom um, that has orbitals of equal energy, like m sub l, um, in the absence of magnetic field, the order that they're filled with electrons is such that the maximum number of electrons are going to have unpaired spins. Okay, so that's Hund's rule. And there's some exceptions, um, but, uh, but in general, that's what you do. So if you look at Hund's rule and consider that one now in, in the filling of shells, let's look here at um, boron, which has uh, five electrons. So you've got your 1s, um, and you've got uh, two electrons in there. You've got your 2s, two electrons in there. And then you've got one electron free for the 2p. But now if you go to carbon, which is the next one, you can see that for each of your m sub l values, um, you're going to have one that's unfilled, but the two electrons will want to be in different m sub l values so that their spins can be parallel. So that's Hund's rule um, and helps describe that. And so on and so forth. It goes up to neon here. Okay, now there's an interesting thing. You might think that you would just fill up your orbitals in terms of your energy. So you go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, uh, 3p, 3d, 4s, but it turns out it doesn't work that way, okay? Here I show a graphic which shows the order in which the orbitals are filled. It goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, so far so good, but then it goes 4s and then 3d. So it turns out that the 4s state is actually a lower energy than the 3d state, and that might seem at first glance confusing, all right? The reason for this is shielding. It's called shielding. What happens is that the order that the orbitals are filled really depends on this shielding. And to remember and understand how this goes, you have to think back to your second semester of introductory physics and remember Gauss's law. Gauss's law um, says that the um, effective charge seen by another charge, if you draw a little Gaussian surface, it'll be the sum of all the charges enclosed by that surface, all right? So this is kind of a confusing concept. Hopefully this little graphic here will help. Here's a picture of an atom. And in the center, you see this positively charged nucleus in sort of an orangey color here. And then the green uh, sphere is um, at, drawn at the radius of an electron that you're interested in looking at. Now, the effective charge that that electron sees will be the sum of all the charges that are inside that green sphere. So if you have your nucleus, of course, that gets counted, but you'll also count any electrons that are inside that green sphere that might be at a smaller radius than the um, electron of interest is, all right? Now, of course, the electrons have a negative charge and the um, protons in the nucleus have a positive charge. So when you sum those up, you're going to see an effective nuclear charge that's less than the actual charge of the nucleus. Okay, So this helps explain why some orbitals might fill earlier than others. If you have an orbit like your 3D that's got a lot of eccentricity to it, in other words, the electrons in that orbit are flung on average further away from the nucleus, then that changes the effective charge seen by an electron of interest and helps explain why um, some orbitals might fill before others. Okay. All right. Um, the shielding is so pronounced that s orbitals, the 4s, fills before the 3d, even though it has a larger n. Okay, so if you take that graphic and uh, that was on the previous slide with the 1s, 2s, 2p, and the orders of filling, and then you figure in and account for how many electrons can sit in each one of those orbitals. So, for example, for every value of m sub l, you've got um, 
two L plus one possible values, two L plus one values of M sub L. And then if you count that you have a spin up and a spin down, then that means that each subshell, each value of L, has two times two L plus one electrons that can fill it, okay? If you combine that with the order, then you can see the periodic table as we know it. So here's your 1s um, on that top row with your hydrogen and helium. That's the filling of that. And then the 2s, and then the 2p, the 3s, and the 3p, the 4s, the 3d, the 4p, and so on and so forth. There's your periodic table. And you can just fill in the names of the atoms into that table. Periodic table explained. To discuss screening just a little bit more, to help you understand this just a bit more, for multi-electron atoms, your positive nuclear charge ZE is going to be shielded by the negative charge of those inner shell electrons. So your outer shell electrons see a net charge that's smaller than your nuclear charge. This is described by this equation here. Um, instead of the equation for the hydrogen atom electron energy, which if you remember was minus 13.6 EV divided by N squared, now if you've got more more than one electron, then your equation becomes 13.6 eV minus 13.6 eV times your effective charge, Z effective, of your nucleus, and then you square that, and then you divide on it by n squared. Now your effective nuclear charge can depend, as a function, on your energy level n, that n quantum number, and your orbital quantum number l. So this is different from the hydrogen atom, where the energy only depends upon the energy level. And this is because, of course, there's no screening if you only have one electron. To go a little bit deeper into this idea of screening, there's a couple of ways to calculate the effective nuclear charge. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm not going to ask you guys to do these calculations, but I do want to kind of give you a hint that there's more to the world out there. So, one of the ways is called Slater's Rules, and they're sort of convoluted and complicated. But there's a simpler one um, that's used, and it's called the Hartree-Fock method. And it's given here, where the effective nuclear charge is equal to the average radius of the hydrogen atom um, divided by the radius for an atom with Z. So this is the mean radius for the hydrogen orbital, and the denominator is the mean radius for the orbital of the electron in question with that nuclear charge Z. So it's sort sort of dependent, as you can see, on where the electron is located. Now, to help you understand why that L might affect, the value of L um, might affect your energy, you can look here. I showed you this chart before, but if you look at the hydrogen atom radial wave functions, you can see that the radial wave function changes with value of n, so the average radius, the expected values of radius, what the cloud looks like, changes of course with the value of the energy level, but also with the value of the orbital, okay? So it changes with the value of the orbital. The functions are totally different for, for example, the 3, 0 versus the 3, 1 versus the 3, 2 state. Okay, So these all give you different orbitals. So you can imagine that the average position of those um, electrons in those different orbitals is going to be different. And that means that the distance from the nucleus is different, which means that if the distance from the nucleus is different, you can have larger or smaller numbers of electrons in between the electron in question and the nucleus. So hopefully that helps hammer that point home. Now this looked kind of complex, and the Hartree-Fock method would be kind of a hard thing to calculate, but sometimes, and your textbook does this, it's a little easier than that. So for example, if you've got just one electron in the outermost orbital of a neutral atom, like you do for the alkali metals, which are in the first column of their periodic table, there's just one valence electron, for example, um, then your effective nuclear charge is pretty much just plus E, because that last electron is very weakly bound, okay, and all the other electrons are closer into the nucleus for those alkali earth metals, and so you can kind of say, well, all the other charges are closer in, and so they're going to cancel out all but one of the protons in the nucleus, so my effective nuclear charge is plus E. Now this isn't perfect, but it does work pretty well for certain elements, and if you put that outermost electron in an excited state so that it's even further away from the nucleus, it works even better. So it's just an approximation, um, but it's something that you might see on your Chapter 8 homework. Okay, um, that covers everything that I wanted to cover in our Chapter 8 Part 1 lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions.